Welcome to Innsbruck, Michael Saylor. Thanks for having me in Innsbruck. Happy to be there. I, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm, I can't give you softball questions, right? Now that you're on European grounds. So um, let's, maybe, let's maybe start with this. Do you ever think about your role being a risk for Bitcoin because you're so influential and so big, not only with your voice, but only with your holdings? You know, um, I do think about it. I think anybody that believes in decentralization has to keep in mind their role. But I think that Satoshi set a really good example. And I think uh, we've, we've seen lots of Bitcoiners uh, during the fork wars. You know, I think there were very strong voices in the Bitcoin community. And um, I, clearly, I think that the, uh, that the message here or the idea is everybody has to take their turn and they have to drive the network forward and they have to do what they can to contribute to the asset class. And there'll be a time when they'll step off of stage and someone else is going to have to pick up uh, and carry uh, the torch forward. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the early cypherpunks. And I wouldn't be here if it weren't for all the heroic activity that took place during the block size wars. And I don't think I'd be here if it weren't for leadership at places like Fidelity, where Like, let's take Abigail Johnson championed Bitcoin at Fidelity. And my first Bitcoin was purchased uh, from Fidelity. Um, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for people like Eric Weiss, who, uh, you know, who orange pilled me. But um, my view of my role is, is um, we needed to, we needed to integrate Bitcoin into the public markets and institutional investors. So I couldn't do what they did. But what I could do is I could uh, show that Bitcoin makes a good treasury asset for a public company. I could actually educate uh, public investors and institutional investors. I could work through the legal issues, the accounting issues, the compliance issues that uh, any, any corporation faces if they want to integrate into the system. And uh, so that needed to be done. Uh, there'll come a time, uh, I, I look forward to the point when I'm irrelevant, when there's a hundred other companies that are bigger than me. When Apple Computer buys $25 billion of Bitcoin and Google buys 50 billion of Bitcoin and then people don't remember MicroStrategy and we can't keep up anymore. And I will, you know, I'll be like that surfer that surfed the wave and then the wave passes you and you just get back on the board and you paddle behind the wave and people don't notice you're there anymore. That'll be okay. I mean, I think, you know, I expect Bitcoin to go on for hundreds if not thousands of years. Each one of us has two, three, five, 10 years we can contribute to it. And then, you know, you could get out of the way and let someone else carry the torch. It's, um, it's nice that you don't not only have a suggestion for Apple or Google um, to buy Bitcoin, but also have a sum in mind already. Um, so my question would be, and I don't know if you know this, but there's like officially, like what we know, there's more Bitcoin nodes running in Germany than anywhere else in the world. The German people are notoriously bad with inflation and now inflation is picking up. Um, the whole Bitcoin scene is just exploding. Um, <coughs> so my question would be, With your example, why is there no German, European company? Why is there no other American company who is just following it so far? Well, first of all, I, I've been doing business in Germany for th nearly 30 years. Germans are great engineers and I love German mines and I love German engineering. And I, I think that Bitcoin, of course, is the first example of, of monetary engineering. So it wouldn't surprise me that Germans uh, that study so much uh, in the world of engineering. They're so fastidious in the way that they engineer their structures, their cars, their engines, their machines. Uh, they'll look at Bitcoin and they'll realize there's engineering beauty there. And so I think that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of passion for Bitcoin in Germany. Uh, with regard to companies, I think the, the key to keep in mind here is that at every single stage, Bitcoin needs something different. And, uh, Starting in the second quarter of 2020 was, uh, was the era of institutional adoption. 
And for an institution to adopt Bitcoin, they have to solve the issue of uh, custody because they have all of these uh, legal restrictions about how they can custody the assets. And they have to solve the, the corporate governance issues. Like for us to buy it, we have to figure out how to disclose it and then, and then um, how, to, um, how to manage our shareholder relations. It was a, it's a very intricate thing. Uh, and, then, um, and then there's an accounting issue. The accounting for Bitcoin was set by uh, FASB when the largest holding of a publicly traded company was maybe a million dollars. When we started looking to buy Bitcoin, we did a search and we found that maybe one company had, ha had owned a couple of million dollars of Bitcoin once a few years ago, over stock or something. It was just, it was a trivial thing. So FASB set the accounting treatment to be the most conservative you could imagine, which is you can never write it up, you can only write it down, and you have to write it down to the lowest bid you can find from anybody anywhere in the world in the history of the ownership of the asset. So that's the same as if you bought something and you went to a party on Saturday night and you asked everybody in the party whether they would buy it from you and someone told you they'd give you a dollar for it. So you wrote it down to a dollar and then you held it at a dollar for the next hundred years. Okay. That is a uh, prejudicial, you know, kind of hostile accounting. It's toxic for a, a public company with a gap, uh, a gap statement. And so there's no reason for the accountants to take any, any other treatment because they were just being extremely conservative. Now we're in a situation where there are billions and billions of dollars of Bitcoin on publicly traded balance sheets. And FASB has taken up the project and, the, and there's massive interest in, in reforming that accounting. So um, I, I think that um, if you're a publicly traded company or a conservatively run company, and the majority of your enterprise value comes from selling cars or selling software or selling anything else, you can't reasonably hold a large amount of Bitcoin on your balance sheet because the volatility of the accounting, uh, it impairs the transparency of your P&L and your balance sheet, and therefore it's toxic to you as a public company. So a conservative CFO or CEO is not going to do it until you get to the point where you could adopt fair value accounting, where you could actually show the true value of, of, the, of the asset. So you, you might think that um, if you're a consumer, you might think, oh, the regulators don't matter. But there's a small number of people on a committee that set accounting standards for all these publicly traded companies, and they do matter. And uh, to the extent that it is uh, impossible to figure out how much the Bitcoin is worth, then that means that uh, 10,000 entities with trillions and trillions of dollars will say, we're just going to wait. We're going to wait. And so I, I think that the reason, uh, you know, if you look at uh, European companies, they're more conservative than American companies. The most aggressive entrepreneurs are like American private companies, you know, like the Ubers or the Airbnbs or, or you know, fairly aggressive. And then sometimes publicly traded companies in America, if they're run by founders, they can take risks. But uh, traditionally in Europe, it's uh, businesses are more conservative. They go a bit uh, They wait for the American companies to take the risk in, in some cases, and they focus upon engineering. So I, I think that what will happen is the, uh, the accounting will matter and the accounting will be uh, will be one uh, element and the other elements will be regulatory clarity from the SEC and the CFTC and Treasury. Though that will allow banks and publicly traded companies to start to handle the asset, then public investors will handle the asset. Uh, and then uh, I think you'll see European companies look at that and they will be emboldened by that and they'll follow. But, you, you, you know, this entire process will probably unfold over a decade from 2020 to 2030. You just, you just uh, talked about the regula regulatory clarity, which is very important not only for the American side, of course, it's also important for, for the European. So basically, as long as the U.S. is letting Bitcoin proliferate, as long as it's not getting you know, any bans or any problems, nobody in the world can really do it because the U.S. has the deepest capital markets, the largest economy, etc. So could you give us 
uh, your view of where do we stand? It, Ethereum just moved to proof of stake. It's basically open warfare out there between crypto and Bitcoin at this point. Um, and and, and the, the day that they move to proof of stake, uh, Gary Gensler goes on the record saying, well, I thought it might be a security all, all along. Um, so where do we stand there? And also one, one added question, are you involved in, with financing or helping um, Bitcoin only lobbying in Washington? Because we know that lobbying is important. Yeah, <clears throat> so with regard to the regulatory issues, first of all, um, I think that, that if you go back and you look at the classes Gensler taught at MIT in 2018, they're all on YouTube and you can just Google Gensler blockchain and money and you'll see them all. I think uh, he laid out clearly uh, the theory of digital property and digital commodities and digital currency and all the issues. And what he pointed out was there are permissioned blockchains and there are permissionless blockchains. And of course, Satoshi's uh, brilliance was figuring out how to transfer value and or manifest value without a trusted intermediary. Uh, and the, the idea is proof of work. But if you want to create a digital commodity, you have to create something without an issuer. You can't have a, a small group of people to control the protocol because a, a group of people controlling the protocol creates an investment contract, and now you're making an investment of money relying on the efforts of others. So the idea here is you have to have um, a digital commodity without an issuer, and then, then you have to let it, you have to let it di diffuse for a long enough period of time without any protocol, uh, without any material change to the economics such that it seasons. Right. And so Bitcoin has a, you know, this 12, 13 year history. And the, the fact that the monetary protocol was set, the, the fact that um, that it traded without value from January 3rd, 2009 till pizza day, 500 years without value is an immaculate conception that has never been reproduced. The fact that Satoshi never moved a coin is another important fact. The fact that it is proof of work is a third important fact. The fact that during the block size wars, right, the small blockers won is an important, another important fact. The fact that you, you know, you've got an unvarnished string of soft forks as opposed to hard forks, uh, that those are all important facts. And so you put them all together, you've got one thing that's universally acknowledged as a digital commodity, Bitcoin. It's the only thing that's ever been universally acknowledged. It's the, it's the only non-controversial, you know, decision. Now you've got um, a bunch of other things uh, that are interesting. The world has a big thirst for digital currency in the form of a stable USD coin. Like the world wants a tether or a circle coin. In fact, the world probably wants $10 trillion of it. Um, and the world's only got about 150 billion right now. So there is a demand for that, but, but then there's a big debate about who can issue it, a bank, a company, a set of entrepreneurs, right? Who, and that will continue. I think that um, with uh, with regard to regulatory clarity, I, I think it was the theory was pretty clear in 20, 2010, Actually, <laughs> the theory was pretty clear in twenty fifteen. Uh, if you want to create a commodity, <clears throat> it must have energy, and it must be without an issuer. Okay, so if I take gold or oranges or oil or, uh, or um, a bushel of grain. And if I remove 99.95% of the energy, you have an imaginary orange, imaginary oil, you, you have a security. If you remove the energy from a commodity, you create a security. That's just common sense, right? Um, and if, if uh, a small group of programmers can write a piece of software that makes all of the oil in Asia not burn, or makes all of the oranges in Florida not edible, that's a security, that's not a commodity. So if you could double the density of gold by writing a piece of software code, it wouldn't be a commodity anymore. It would be a security, right? So this is kind of common sense. I mean, it's not even, you don't even need the law. You just kind of need to think common sense. If five programmers get to make all your food not edible, is the food a commodity anymore? And answer is no, it's a coupon or it's a security. So um, in this particular case, 
Gensler actually said when he was put in the SEC that staking tokens, if, if, if there's a stake and you generate yield, that's an investment contract. He said that a year ago. So um, he's, I think he's become more forceful in his articulation in the aftermath of the crypto crash. And, um, and, and I think what he's saying is very straightforward. If you want to create a commodity, it has to be without an issuer. It has to flunk the Howey test. And if you've got an issuer, if you've got a small group of people, if they have control over the protocol, then uh, it's probably a security uh, for common sense reasons. I think that um, the regulators will move forward on this. There'll be some back and forth. There's going to be political debates. Most of the crypto industry has a vested interest in, cre in keeping ambiguity, right? <laughs> keeping this ambiguous, right? And so, so most of them, you know, they'll say, well, we haven't gotten clear guidance. Well, there is clear guidance. You, you know, if you've got a company and you issue equity in the form of a token, it's a security. There's clear guidance, right? If you created a company and you gave yourself the stock and then you sold stock to investors and then you sold the general public and then you keep changing the code that controls what you can do with the stock, it's a security. So I think what Gensler said is just because you don't like the guidance doesn't mean you don't have it, right? Um, so, uh, you know, to that point, I think that um, we're going to actually see the industry mature. I think it's getting harder and harder uh, to feign ignorance and for people to be oblivious to these uh, to these material differences. Um, I think that uh, I think that uh, there are some crypto organizations uh, that are lobbying both sides of the fence, right? And uh, you know, I, I think that's frustrating. But uh, I also think there are some Bitcoin only. Uh, organizations that are doing a good job of articulating uh, the ethical benefits of proof of work. Uh, I do support some of them, uh, you know, and other people that I know support some of them. And I would encourage anybody to support the, uh, the Bitcoin only organizations because they don't have a conflict of interest. Um, I think, you know, to the point, if we start from basic principles, we wanted a treasury reserve asset and we wanted a digital gold or a digital commodity <clears throat> without an issuer that could be global and neutral. And so we looked at all of the thousands and thousands of cryptos and we concluded it needed to be a proof of work type asset. And we looked at every proof of work asset and Bitcoin was the dominant and it was the one uh, with the best monetary policy, uh, with the clearest ideology. And then we asked the question, well, will it be banned Will it be copied? Will it be hacked? It hadn't been hacked, hacked for a decade, so I figured that was good. Uh, will it be banned? No, it was, it, it was anointed as, a, as property by the IRS and as a commodity, and we knew it was a commodity. And I think that, that is only, those facts have only improved. I think it's pretty clear they're supporting the Senate and Congress and the SEC and the CFTC all through the world, even across many governments, uh, for Bitcoin as a digital commodity. There are, there are a lot of regulators that have concerns about when you use it as a currency because they see it might be threatening uh, to their local currencies. Look, every country in the world has capital controls. You know, you can't just move capital out of China. You can't move capital out of Argentina. You can't move capital out of Lebanon or Turkey. Um, so, so when it's used as currency, there are a lot, you get a lot of um, a lot of capital control issues or KYC issues or or the like, uh, or, you know, AML issues. But um, as property, it's not controversial, and it, it looks like even as cross-border payments, it's not going to be. A lot of people are going to allow you to do cross-border payments. So. I think that in the dimension of will it be banned? No, it's going the opposite direction. It's not being banned. And now we're back to this issue of will it be copied? It got copied thousands of times, but most of the times the copies were imperfect because the people that copied it didn't understand uh, the engineering elegance. It's like copying the wheel, but making it an octagon or, you know, or making it a, you know, a rectangle or something. It's like they copied it wrong. Um, <clears throat> it actually was extremely elegant 
because the goal of Bitcoin was to be able to support hundreds of trillions of dollars on the base layer and let you build other layers like Lightning and applications on top of it and serve as the foundation. So, so uh, they copied it wrong for the most part. When you put all the other Turing complete functionality into the other copies, they made a mistake. What they should have done is just copied it right. But of course, you can't really copy the Immaculate Conception and, and everybody that copied it wanted to make money. And the point is, if you, if you really wanted to copy it, you need to create something more elegant and you need to not have any economic interest in it and you need to give it as a gift to the world and you can't actually get, make money off it and you need to disappear. So that's the way to copy it. I think that the irony right now, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish my comment, is, is people are very busy uncopying it Right, uh, Bitcoin was maybe 75% of proof of work networks before the merge, and now it's 95%. So in fact, uh, it's been uncopied because people, you know, I, I used to joke, right? If you have a brilliant engineering insight, your competitor may in fact look at it and say, why would I wanna do that thing? And so Bitcoin is so brilliant that many of the competitors, they, they literally, they're blinded by their own personal self-interest and their own egos. And so rather than appreciate the brilliance of it, they don't actually appreciate the fact that the whole point was to avoid having a company uh, or avoid having a counterparty or avoid having a set of programs. You know, some people think I have to keep changing this, the code. I have to keep upgrading the software. The brilliance is not changing the software, right? What they don't realize is to be a commodity, you can't keep changing it. But if you're a software engineer, you wanna keep changing stuff. So half of the crypto world wants to keep changing the code. And what they don't realize is if you can change the code of Bitcoin, you probably made it a security, not a commodity. And if you remove the energy from Bitcoin, you probably made it security, not a commodity. So the idea that a bunch of smart engineers are gonna add a bunch of functionality, change it every year and suck the energy out of it is converting a digital commodity into a digital security. They just don't have enough grounding in all of the various disciplines to realize how horrific a mistake that is. This, this does perfectly lead me to my next question. So Bitcoin author Der Gigi, he had a great thread a couple of years ago, a failure to understand proof of work is a failure to understand Bitcoin. With regards to proof of work, the, the propaganda in the mainstream media right now against it is relentless. It's absolutely everywhere. Um, around the, the Ethereum merge, Greenpeace is tweeting at the Bitcoin CEO 24 seven, um, trying to quote unquote change the code. Wh why is it and who is working so hard against proof of work? And why is it that, that it seems that many people just don't want to understand that it actually can help in many relation in many relations and maybe the second question what's the situation of bitcoin mining in the u.s right now what what developments do you see you know um as i get older i'm more of the opinion that many of these 501c3s many of these non-profit charity organizations they start out um they start out with a good idea and then they run out of money and so then they go look around for someone to give them money. And so I think like 40 or 50 years ago, someone gave money uh, to a Greenpeace type organization to lobby against nuclear power. And probably it was the oil and gas industry that gave a lot of money to these charities to lobby against nuclear power, to shut down the nuclear power industry. And then ironically, uh, another 30 or 40 years, the solar and the uh, wind lobby gives money to them to lobby against the oil and gas industry. And then when they run out of that, you know, uh, other crypto promoters are giving money to, all, to, to these environmental lobbyists. They're just giving them huge amounts of money to lobby against uh, Bitcoin. It's like that. It's not really bona fide environmental interest. If you're an environmentalist, you would be focused upon saving the trees or saving the seals or, or, or 
doing something in order to cultivate parks and the like. But 99.92% of all the carbon comes from something other than energy that fuels proof of work. So I actually think um, it's it's the other crypto promoters that are fi- that are generating all of the attack points. They're generating all the propaganda. They're feeding it. They're funneling it through academics. They're funneling it through politicians. They're funneling it through 501c3s and and through environmental activists. And so you have to just follow the money. And uh, <clears throat> they're funneling it through their lobbyists. And I think their agenda is they're all promoting unregistered securities. So all of all of these uh, other cryptos are for the most part unregistered securities. And uh, so you have to have a justification for promoting a crypto token that doesn't use energy. Well, the, if you understood securities law and if you thought about physics, you would realize that when you slurp the energy out of the commodity, it becomes a security. And, it, and when you convert the security to be programmatic, when you create a virtual world, uh, a, a virtual energy and use virtual machines to create virtual security, to create a virtual token, you have created, you've got a software company and that's equity in the software company and you've created a security which you're then selling to the general public. And if you're gonna sell equity to the general public, you need to do it pursuant to fair and full disclosure that's ongoing every quarter, every year, continuous, because the general public deserves to know who's gonna actually change the definition of the token, right? Who's running the company? And uh, so I think that you have an entire crypto industry and a lot of crypto promoters that they've got this kind of existential problem and there's no way to defend it. I mean, there really is no defense to, uh, to creating a token, giving it to yourself, selling it to the general public and not disclosing. And so the best way to deal with it is change the subject. So we change the subject to energy usage is bad and the reason that you should let us exist and the reason you buy our token is because Bitcoin is bad for the environment, right? Well, it, it's bad for the environment in the same way that oranges and meat and buildings and cars are bad for the environment. They all use energy. In fact, hospitals use energy, right? So if I went to you and I said, I'm going to eliminate your hospital and I'm going to replace it with a virtual imaginary hospital that's going to actually lower the cost of health care. And I'm going to fix your avatar up. Whenever your avatar has a has an imaginary heart attack, I'll give you imaginary surgery and I'll make you imaginary healthy. And you could pay me in imaginary coins and then you'll go home imaginary happy, right? I mean, sure, you could do it, but it's ridiculous. It's it's like uh, meta money for the metaverse with meta meta energy. So maybe give us for the last question give us your outlook how is this going to end are the other cryptos just going to be ruled securities and just going to basically disappear and then then people will flock into bitcoin this is going to hit bitcoin maybe what if if the lobbyists are successful and ethereum becomes a digital commodity quote unquote um bitcoin has also been used now on the state level or at least we we see rumors about this Um, what are you seeing where are we going in the next couple of years I think that the the market is going to become more and more educated. And as the market gets more educated, uh, it's going to see the virtues of Bitcoin as the dominant digital commodity. And Bitcoin is going to get stronger. I think that uh, that regulators, as they focus on this, the more when you focus on it and you bring a lot of attention to bear, I think they're going to realize that uh, they need to segment the market into digital currencies, uh, digital securities, digital commodities. And they're going to set precedents by their rulings where it's going to become more clear. It's already becoming clear to institutional investors. And you, you can see, for example, you're reading about the comments of the chair of the SEC in the Wall Street Journal on the front page. And you're reading about it in Bloomberg. If you roll the clock back two years, I don't think Bloomberg and the Wall Street Journal really understood the difference between 10,000 crypto tokens. But I think today it's, it's becoming critical for, for multi-billion dollar investors and big banks and, and big uh, regulators and politicians to understand the difference between uh, uh, 
a US dollar stable coin and a crypto property in the form of a Bitcoin and a crypto token that's a security. And they, you know, uh, there will be a lot of sound and fury for the next couple of years while we sort it out. But I have confidence that the world will eventually sort it out because, because um, there are physics involved here and there's a lot of rationale involved here. So I think <clears throat> the first stage is sorting out uh, the crypto segmentation and people realizing the difference between a crypto commodity, a cryptocurrency, a crypto security, and a crypto exchange. And they're going to get regulated and 80 to 90 percent of the capital is going to sit in the regulated world and then there'll be a gray market that'll fester on for a while uh and and that'll continue the second stage right i mean uh if you think about it first people need to understand why bitcoin is a superior crypto asset to every other crypto asset for a long-term store of value or for sovereignty that was the first thing microstrategy went through the second thing they need to understand is why is Bitcoin superior to gold as a bearer instrument or, or a commodity or precious metal store of asset, uh, value? And so that's going to that's gonna be the second uh, stage. And the third stage is why is Bitcoin as crypto property superior to other forms of property? <clears throat> right. The, the crypto crypto world has about a trillion dollars worth of money floating around and we're trying to sort out which is the superior crypto asset right and for what and, and the truth is i really believe the killer application is <clears throat> is a lightning wallet on eight billion smartphones that has us dollars as a short-term medium exchange and payment network and btc as a store of value and it runs on lightning and then it is secured by the underlying Bitcoin uh, base chain, base layer. That is that is uh, going to be the voice over IP moment or the web, the, the, uh, the Netscape moment. When you actually have the ability to download a Lightning wallet in 30 seconds and trade US dollars with all 8 billion people on the planet friction free, when that happens, that'll go viral and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people will first grab that in the first year and then billions of people will grab that. So <clears throat> I think that technology is gonna play a role here in spreading things if you look at that. But from the investor point of view, there's a trillion dollars that's being argued over in the crypto world. There's $10 trillion in the precious metals world of gold. There's more than a hundred trillion dollars of property. And then of course, ultimately there's $500 trillion of other assets. And so what we're gonna go through is just a very intense education process. And there's gonna be a lot of fighting because there's a lot of money at stake, right? And if, if you have that much money at stake, you know, no one's going to go easily. And there's gonna be lots of lobbying and lots of positioning. But ultimately, you know, ultimately uh, the market will be will decide, and and the the thing that will cause Bitcoin to win is that everyone that understands proof of work is going to realize that Bitcoin is the best proof of work network, and that's why it's ninety five percent. And then people that buy into proof of stake, they're going to be in a war to keep upgrading their proof of stake cryptos and they'll keep hard forking and hard forking and hard forking and ultimately uh the competition between all of the various proof of stake networks over who's got the most functionality and who's got the most performance will devolve into a technology competition of software companies and they will be recognized as software companies and eventually they'll have to register as software companies and they will centralize and they will they will deal with all the challenges of software companies. They'll have compliance issues. You know, there'll be certain things they can do or they can't do. And uh, and the typical investor that wants to invest in a software company will sift between the various ones. But someone that wants to store their value for 100 years is not going to trust the software company and a government is not gonna, they're not gonna actually invest their sovereign treasury in a software company stock 
There's no way that a government, the United States is not going to trust a Chinese software company. China is not going to trust an American software company. And so ultimately, we'll get back to first principles, which is you're going to create something that runs when a billion people run a node, right? A, a, a node, right, it, it is in essence uh, self sovereignty. When a billion people run a node and Bitcoin miners are running in every country on earth and no one can put their finger on, on the network and nobody, you know, the difference between me and some of these other uh, advocates is I am quite sure I am not responsible for Bitcoin being as good as it is. And I am not, I'm sure that I can't change it. And if I disappear tomorrow, it won't make a difference. And, and I have a, enough life experience to realize that um, it doesn't need fixing, right? When a, when a billion people are running a decentralized node, no one's going to be able to change it. It is truly a digital commodity, which makes it a basis of sovereignty and freedom and property rights for the human race for the next thousand years, if not 10,000 years. We might actually trace the singularity to January 1st, 2009, when humanity finally had property rights that uh, could not be seized. And before 2009, we were living with imperfect property rights and defective money. And after 2009, we had property rights and we had energy flowing into the digital realm. And that might, that might change humanity for thousands and thousands of years. So I, I have, I'm confident and optimistic that this is, it's a pretty important thing. And I don't think, I met lots of people I, I, I have confidence that other objective people, you know, neutral observers, they will come to the same conclusion. The disinterested parties will come to the same conclusion. And as they come to that conclusion, the market will segment and things will sort themselves out in, in a rational fashion for the good of humanity. Michael Saylor, thank you so much. There's nothing much I can add to a sentence that ends with for the good of humanity. Um, you said it's going to be a wild ride. We are all going to be here for the wild ride. I'd love to already invite you for the BTC 23 next year. Maybe you can make it or we, we chat again. Thank you for taking the time. All the best. I will look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Innsbruck. And, and thank you, everyone that supports Bitcoin. Keep up the good work. <laughs>